All right, well, my name is Nirm. I've been running Final Fantasy IV for uh, a couple of years now, which is crazy to think about. And um, this is Final Fantasy IV Any% Percent, um, with no credit warp. Um, this will employ a number of glitches to beat the game almost as fast as possible. There's something slightly faster, which is not marathon safe, so this will be no credit warp. But uh, we'll have plenty of fun with uh, all kinds of glitches. And I am ready to go. So in three, two, one, go. Thank you very much. So this is Final Fantasy IV, also known uh, in the US, released as Final Fantasy II originally. You notice the title screen said Final Fantasy II. Uh, this is the second Final Fantasy game to hit the United States and the first Final Fantasy game to introduce uh, the active time battle system. Uh, all the prior Final Fantasy titles all had, um, you know, it was all completely turn-based and then you do all the party actions and then all the battle, battle would play out, however. And in this one, um, there is an active time battle system where uh, your characters will just basically get turns based on their agility values instead of just you pre-planning everything and having the turn order play out however it does. And so that's pretty cool. Um, this was the first iteration of the active time battle system. And so they don't have... Final Fantasy IV doesn't have the gauges that you see in uh, future releases of Final Fantasy. I know, 5, 6, 7... Uh, you can always see, like see their action action bars queuing up before you can do any actions. In this one, you just kind of have to know, which is, I mean, it's, it's okay, I guess. Uh, so starting out here, um, I'm not sure if it got captured on screen uh, stream or not, but I did a little uh, pre-setup to manipulate the RNG seed uh, prior to starting the run. And what that's going to do is, for the first 10 minutes of this run, it's going to allow me to... Uh, walk through the first cave and not have any encounters. It's going to save me a little bit of time. And then, um, if if this weren't a marathon setting and I had more at my disposal, I would be doing um, a step route past um, past a certain point. But uh, unfortunately, I I'm not set up to do so. And in order to be marathon safe, I want to save and reset in a couple places. So uh, this is going to be a little slower than optimal, just because I will not be. Uh, using a step route. Uh, what a step route is, is you basically take extra steps in certain certain places where um, uh, it's, it, it's impossible to get encounters, such as inside towns, inside castles, or in rooms with save points in them. And if you take steps, it's, it counts toward the step counter, but you don't get into encounters, so you can potentially skip encounters just by walking around in a room. And um, a couple of people uh, by the name of myself086, as well as Exiden and uh, Fred Coughlin, have all, all been uh, coming up with uh, different step routes for um, all the potential seeds that you can get when you reset. Um, there are 256 seeds in this game, and there is a step route for each, each and every seed that's been uh, calculated out. So there's been a lot of work put into this game, especially in the last year or so, uh, in order to really uh, grind the times down. Uh, for this category, the current uh, fastest time is a 157 and change by a man from Australia known as the Roth. Um, Roth has the record in basically all prevalent categories of this game and is uh, pretty darn good. Also an awesome dude. Yeah, he's a cool guy from Australia. Does Australian things. He's also a professional pool player. Plays on the Australian world team, so shout out to Roth. So here um, we are uh, delivering the crystal to the king, and the king's getting mad at us because we're like, uh, why do we do this? And he's like, don't question me. And so we've been ostracized to delivery boy. Uh, right here I'm going to be picking up a tent in this room. Uh, this tent is going to be used in a glitch in a little bit um, known as the mist clip glitch. And what that is is you'll see it in, I don't know, maybe like five five to six minutes is that'll allow me to walk over the town of mist and enter it from the opposite side and what that does is it gives me access to a bunch of uh, late game equipment that I shouldn't have access to for at least you know an hour and a half into the game so it's really nice speeds things along a little bit uh, like I said this is any percent um, so we utilize basically every glitch at our disposal to try to try and complete this game as fast as possible. Um, yeah. 
So a little bit of personal history with this game. Uh, you're going to see me taking an extra step here. That's actually to avoid an encounter. Uh, personal history with this game, um, this is my first RPG. Um, I played it probably when I was either 5 or 6 years old. Uh, I'm 27 now, so it's been a while. Um, I don't think I ever finished it as a kid. Uh, it wasn't until I replayed it, maybe when I was 17 or 18, that I actually uh, finished this. I actually got stuck on a boss and you know rage quit forever <laughs> until I got older. Uh, why did you end up speedrunning this game? What drew you to it? So I ended up speedrunning this game. Um, there's a different category called any percent no 64, which doesn't use a particular glitch involving stairs. And um, I was I had basically just found out about GDQ and saw speedruns. I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And then I started watching RPG speedruns you know, because I liked RPGs. And um, there were a bunch of people running this game. Uh, El Magus, Doosler, uh Crumps at the time. And um, at that point in time, um, there was it was just discovered that a different route was like 10 to 15 minutes faster, or not even. It wasn't actually known how much faster it was, but it was definitely faster. And so um, there was all kinds of like strategies were being thrown around at the time. And I was interested, you know, because I was like, oh hey, I can help out with this. You know, what if I try this, this, and this, or this, this, and this? So I fired up the game uh, and I like plowed through it. Like I kind of watch, kind of watching speedruns, and just trying to get an idea for what, like what worked and what didn't. I ended up speedrunning the game, and um, like probably two to three weeks into speedrunning this game, I was I was the record holder for that category, um, and that was before, and that was you know while the route was still in a state of flux, and uh, there was a lot of a lot of optimization still to be done. So it the um, I guess the amount of like planning and routing really interested me a lot enough to get me running this game and I've been running it ever since um, I haven't really picked up any of the speed games uh, since that point at least not in as much detail as this and um, obviously a lot of there's been a lot of changes a lot of new runners a lot of runners dropped out and so it, it's it's been really interesting to see this game evolve um, when, I, when I first got my record it was like a 325 in the no 64 category and now that record's like a 307 so it's it's almost 18 minutes faster than when I started two years ago. Yeah, it's always fun when, uh, especially in an RPG, when the route's in flux. Just you know, there's so many different things going around. There's you feel like there's just tons of potential. There's things you got to test. And the community just seems to always kind of come together when that happens. It's always a really cool experience. Yeah, the Final Fantasy IV community specifically um, is really really cool. A bunch of cool people. Um, it's definitely if you're interested in running an RPG, if you have any interest in running this RPG. Um, there's a ton of people who are more than happy to jump up, jump up and help you and give you the help you need. All right. So to start out here, uh, I'm going to be setting my battle speed to 1 and my battle message speed to 1, obviously, to speed things up as much as possible. Um, one other little thing in this game is that... Sorry, give me one second. And uh, in certain menus, uh, if you press a direction or press out an input, and then follow it with like a, a Y input or a select input, and it'll actually duplicate the previous input. And it's a technique called plinking. Uh, you, might, you might know it from fighting games. Um, it's very similar. You can just basically duplicate inputs uh, quicker than you can input the same thing twice. So uh, it's utilized at a couple of different points throughout the run. But uh, I really, uh, that's something Roth does really well that um, I think uh, the, tr the best runners of this game are going to be able to plink like monsters. So you'll notice because I set my seed prior to starting this run, I'm not getting any encounters in this cave, which is pretty convenient. So how did you set your seed? You were kind of just, you were, uh, for people that didn't, couldn't see it on stream, he was uh, like walking forward from this one uh, scene and then uh, kind of resetting kind of constantly. What were you looking for? What was going on? So, um, sorry, one second. Um, so that, that particular room that's kind of like glitched out like that has a property of when you press A, it actually it will like crash the game and force you to reset, but it sets the RNG value at something specific. And then when you press A on the title screen, your um, your basically your battle seed gets, your encounter seed gets set. And so you have to time your A input on the title screen and then using the glitch room does stuff. Sorry, I have an audio cue right here. Alright. 
So here I'm going to be duping um, Kane's uh, Iron Shield for money. Um, and that's going to allow us to have all the money we'll possibly need for the run. Next up. There's a crit. I needed that. The damage is pretty terrible in this fight. Alright, so this is the misclip I was talking about maybe four or five minutes ago. So the way this works is you um, you can take a half step and interrupt it with a menu. And by going into the menu and then using something that uh, basically stops you from walking, the, um, it, it basically shifts the map over, but it still looks like you're on this tile. So now I can walk on the town. And a little bit of menuing here. Oops. Sorry, uh, that messed up stream. I'm sorry. You're good. All right, good. And so now I can walk into the other side of Mist. And what's really interesting is that after this cutscene, um, the town of Mist doesn't have a right entrance. And so the fact that that even exists in the first place is very, very strange. So now I have all the money I could ever need, and I'm going to buy these dancing daggers, which are going to uh, come in handy for the rest of the run. It's basically middle middle game equipment that is I'm getting 10 minutes in, so that's, that's really nice. Uh, also in this house, I'm going to be picking up uh, the tiara and the change rod. Uh, change rod gives a, a rather hefty magic boost, and the tiara gives even more of a magic boost. But uh, what I really want from the tiara is the defensive stats for Rydia, because um, there's no grinding in this particular route. Um, all the experience I get is going to be from bosses, and so uh, and then one, one additional fight. And so um, it's basically essential that um, I have as, as good of gear as I could possibly get. And see right there, hit, that's hitting the trigger that you normally would have been if you had gone in from the normal side of the town, right? Yeah, that's correct. So if, if you had gone in the normal side of the town, you would have started like that little square on the left over there, and then you would have walked in and hit the trigger. And you can you can actually continue on past the town and go along your merry way, but um, there's a particular story trigger that isn't there. And then when you get to a certain point later on, probably about 20 minutes later, the game just soft locks, actually hard locks. But so we have to come in here and blow up the village. Ruin Radius Day. So story-wise, uh, the king gave you this package to deliver to the village of Mist, which is a village of summoners. And then you get to the village, the package opens, you burn the whole village down, including and you killed Radius' mother to get here, which was the Mist Dragon. And so now we're like, uh-oh, we messed up. So here I'm going to arrange my inventory in such a way that um, items are where I want them to be for now. Uh, it's one of the, I guess, the finer points of a, any RPG speedrun, really, but especially this one, is um, having your inventory arranged in such a way that the items you need are near the top of the list, and you don't have to scroll down through them. Um, by moving items in battle during animations or during dialogue, it doesn't actually waste me any time to be scrolling through my inventory. And so by moving junk I don't need all the way down to the bottom or further down to the bottom, I don't have to like scroll through it later when I act I'm actually just burning time trying the menu. So if I were doing step route, this is the point where I would determine what step route I was on based on when I would get an encounter. Um, we have a nice little chart and everything that's associated with it, but not happening this time. So you did that item duping in the battle. How does that work? And are you, gonna, are you only doing that just once, or is that going to be done elsewhere? I am going to be doing it one more time. So that um, by um, selecting a slot that's not the first empty slot, like like any slot that's not the first empty slot, and then selecting an item, the item will actually go into the first empty slot, and then it'll actually um, basically take one away from the slot that you're on. So when you re-equip the um, when you go back onto the, the hand slot and then like re-equip from the slot that you originally chose, it actually equips uh, that minus one, and so you can dupe items that way. So, Programming oversight. So right here, um, this is uh, the first introduction of camp run buffering. If I get lucky with my ATB rolls, um, I can actually kill all three guards before 
they get in a, a turn, but unfortunately I wasn't lucky there. Uh, the whole idea behind Can't Run Buffering is uh, while the dialogue box is up there, the ATB is totally frozen, and that lets me get in inputs um, faster than um, I would normally. Um, even if I was holding A, there's still those frames that go by where the ATB is charging for the enemy, whereas while the di Can't Run dialogue box is up there, then their ATB is totally frozen. And so it's just a very minor way to get my turns a little bit faster. And it's not as important as it is in this fight as it is uh, in future fights. So it's something you'll be seeing um, further on down the road. So here I have a little bit of menuing to do. We're going to put that tiara on Radia for the defense, and then we're going to move her to the back row. Because um, when you're in the back row, you take less damage. So here we find Rosa, who in the beginning we saw with Cecil. She's caught sand fever, but we don't care, we just leave her. <laughs> don't leave me, Cecil. Nah, 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 we're out of here. So we're moving on up in the world. Um, interesting thing about this town is if you take a, if you walk out of the right side right there, it actually spits you out on the right. Whereas if you walk straight down, it spits you out on the bottom. All right, four Sandman. I believe that was step like 44 and 45. Not that it matters. So you have a program for that? If you're if you were doing this at home and doing a serious attempt, you would have a computer with a set of notes and a program, and you would be um, charting your counter based on that, or it, how would you be doing it's that? It's not exactly a program, though I'm sure one could be written. Um, there's actually basically this huge list of numbers, and then um, ba and then you, a picture with basically each. Know, each step has a number associated with it, and so um, you basically judge. You see, oh, okay, I'm on step 44, and then you look at the chart, and there's basically a range of seeds that say, okay, seeds like 120 to 125 have their first encounter on step 44, and then you narrow it down from there. So I just picked up Tella. He's all uh, there's, a be there's an evil monster at the end. None shall pass, or they will die. And we're all like, oh, we're cool. And he's like, okay. So Tellus chasing down his daughter, Anna, who eloped with some bard. And he's not happy about it. So, an interesting thing to talk about in this game um, is encounters. So, uh, what encounters you get is, and basically when you get them, is based on a set seed. And as long as you know what seed you're on, you'll know when you're going to get these encounters. But um, whether or not they're like strike first, or back attacks, or surprise attacks, is completely frame based. And it's frame based, and you can also, interestingly enough, you can affect that, basically that value by holding buttons as you go into battles, or which characters in front, which, or which characters currently displayed from the party also affects that. And so um, it's not impossible to manipulate um, the encounters to get um, basically all normal encounters with no dialogue. Like that. That, that is the ideal encounter right there. Uh, whereas if I, get, if I get any dialogue, obviously back attacks and surprise attacks waste a ton of time. And, or if I drop GP, that's also bad. So... Um, that's something that's in the works being developed by myself086, which is his Twitch handle. It's, it's not myself, me personally. <laughs> and I'm sure he did that just to confuse everybody. Oh, well, he did a good job because it comes up a lot. <laughs> and so a habit of mine is just to switch characters a lot. You see me doing that throughout the run, and it bugs you. Then too bad. <laughs> so here we're gonna swing down and pick up the darkness sword. Um, that's gonna boost Cecil's attack damage for the upcoming boss battle, and it's going to help us out pretty tremendously, actually. Um, so interestingly enough, even though Rydia is level 1, she's the only one in the party who can currently equip Dancing Daggers. And because of that, she becomes the primary damage dealer in this upcoming boss fight. And um, so, unfortunately, even with the uh, the tiara that we picked up, 
No soft lock, please. Thank you. Uh, even with the TR that we picked up, she can still take a ton of damage. She can take anywhere from 1 to 18 damage from this boss. And considering she has 30 health, uh, that can go pretty awry pretty quickly. And Octomom has, is actually a very interestingly coded boss. Uh, Octomom starts with a bunch of tentacles and every t and super high agility. It's like faster than the final boss in the in the beginning of this fight. And but then every two hits that Octomom will take, uh, Octomom loses a tentacle and the agility drops of the boss. So. Ideally, uh, the quickest way to kill this boss is to reduce tentacles as fast as possible, and then um, the more tentacles you reduce, obviously, the slower the boss gets and the more turns you get, so it just goes faster. Um, if things go ideally in this battle, when I get there, um, you're going to see me cast Stop on Tella, and it's actually interesting that um, it, it hits a certain point to where actually getting turns with Tella is basically a waste of time. And so it's faster to have him not do anything and be completely useless. So there I, equi I equip the Darkness Sword right there in the battle. It's a little bit quicker than going into the menu. So here I'm going to do some more item moving. I want this trash can high. So you see Octomom's losing tentacles. Here I'm going to stop Tello. Uh, stop has a chance to miss. So if that happens, it's a bummer. It didn't happen. Good. So now it's just Cecil and Radia getting turns. And hopefully Octomom isn't a jerk and leaves Radia alone. <laughs> of course. Alright, so here I have a lot of time to do uh, menuing uh, because there's dialogue at this particular point in the fight. So oh. I can move everything down. Good. Is this hella talking through the stop over there? Yeah, he's like. Uh, he's actually gonna come out of it right here. This hit should kill. Yeah, okay. So that's actually a, a really decent fight. Uh, Octomom left Radio alone for the most part, and that's really the key. It's a good fight versus a bad fight. Uh, sometimes you have to cure with Tella, sometimes you even have to life with Tella, and then Life 1 also has the ability to miss, which is fantastic. Great programming choice. So here I'm going to do a little bit more menuing, and then if I wanted to, I could actually... Uh, save and reset here to skip this cutscene, um, but because I had a lot of encounters right before the boss, um, it's probably not ideal for me to do that, so I'm not going to. Uh, why do you, why, you, why is it uh, depend on how many encounters you had? So um, the encounters are, you get a certain number per 256 steps, um, and then some seeds are weighted towards the back of that 256 steps, so you might get, say you get steps on like 200, 202, 204, like 209, something like that, and then different seeds, um, like maybe they're early, like more spread out. And so because I had a, a lot of encounters um, right before the boss, that means that um, my potential of getting encounters um, in, up in the upcoming dungeon is, in, in mathematical theory, it's reduced just because I've already, Law of Averages says, you spoony bard, that's what Law of Averages says. And so here I'm pausing during a uh, dialogue. Um, this is because uh, the in-game timer um, actually matters for a glitch I'm going to be doing uh, basically right at the end of the run. And I want it to be at a particular value. Um, otherwise, the game will crash and I will have to reload a save. Um, and so, in or so pausing in battle while spell animations are going off or while dialogue is happening will halt the in-game timer, but obviously 
the uh, dialogue and or animations will progress. And so it's it's a way to slightly manipulate the in-game timer and um, I don't really have a way of knowing how the rest of the run is going to go, per se, but I, I can at least um, pause now to get a better idea of what my timer is going to be later. So if something goes awry later, I can be like, okay, I won't pause anymore. Or if something goes, if things continue to go relatively well, then I can decide what to do at that point. So Tella gets mad, slaps, uh, slaps Cecil out of the way, leaves because Anna died protecting Edward, who is actually the crown prince of this town, or this castle, per se. Um, castle was blown up by the Red Wings. Um, Cecil was captain of the Red Wings before he got kicked out, and now we know Golbez is the captain of the Red Wings, and Tella's gonna go kill him. Cecil returns the slap to Edward, says, hey, my girlfriend is sick, please help me. You're the only one who can help me. And Edward's like, okay, you slap me, so I have to, I have to help you. Alright, so moving on. The uh, the next boss we're going to run into is Antlion. Um, and Edward is the second character that we get that can equip Dancing Daggers. And so uh, now I have two damage dealers who can who can all do like anywhere from 250 to 400 damage per turn. And Antlion is normally a pretty hard boss in a, I guess, a casual playthrough because you don't have the Dancing Daggers and Antlion will counter any physical attacks that are done. And so, um, fortunately, uh, Dancing Daggers are considered a magical attack, and so he, Antlion will not counter that, and Antlion only has 1,000 HP, so it can t in 3 to 4 Dancing Daggers, Antlion will be down. So, having those Dancing Daggers kind of really trivializes this boss. So there's a life in this chest, and in the event I get back attacked and Rigier gets sniped, uh, I have the means to pick her back up. It's important that she lives through this boss battle uh, because she needs the experience in order to survive the next boss battle. Um, she might not necessarily need it, but um, it's definitely a nice cushion to have. So for safety and slash marathon purposes, I'll grab that chest. And I guess in the average run I wouldn't. Uh, it really depends on what HP value Rigier is at. Pretty decent walk. Uh, here's Antlion. Edward's like, oh, I'll just grab the Sand Ruby. Antlion won't hurt me. And of course he's wrong. And so here we go. Cecil doesn't do anything in this fight. Oops. 370, 270. Let's see, that's what, 540? This needs to be a 360 from Edward if I want a quick kill. It is not. So unfortunately a 4 dagger, I didn't really have much control over that. Just the luck of damage rolls. But Riddy is alive, Edward's alive, everybody's alive. I can't complain. So now we got the Sand Ruby, Edward's all like, Why did it line attack me? The world is scary. And so one other theme of this game is that almost every character gets a cape. I think it's just like, law. I don't understand. I believe in the end party, Kane is the only one who doesn't have a cape. Spoilers. Uh, at least in the normal playthrough. And party might be a little bit different in this one. So, so far so good. Um, fights have gone relatively well. Um, and I don't have too much I can complain about at this point. Uh, coming up is um, a cutscene where Edward fights a water hag. Oh boy. Strike first is good. Better than... Whenever you see a dialogue box, you're always like, oh no! But when it's strike first, you're like, okay, that's acceptable. You're still losing time because of the dialogue box itself. But the ability to run away immediately is kind of nice. 
instead of having to sit there and wait for your attacks. So how much time does that cost over just a normal one, especially if you're saying you have to wait a bit for the runaway? Um, it depends on the encounter pack for back and surprise attacks. Um, particularly bad ones can waste up to 30 seconds. Um, just it, like say there's like a pack of seven, you have to wait for all seven attacks before you can run away on a back or surprise attack. And then also some monsters, it's scripted into where they will um, they will cast a spell instead of attacking. Then you have to sit there and wait for the spell animation, which takes a little bit longer than the, the an attack does. And so there's a couple of bad encounters later on where if I, it's a back attack, it just wastes so much time. Um, and then the strike, the strike first dialogue box takes about three seconds. And same thing with dropping GP. It's just basically um, for what it is right now, on an uncontrollable point of randomness. Whereas if you're doing manipulation, which is where this run is going in the future, uh, there's already a couple runners I know that are at least attempting to do it. Um, it the times are going to go down for sure. So when you do manipulation, can you control battle damage as well, or is it only encounters? Um, so the way the back attack manipulation works is um, it doesn't specifically know what seed you're on. It knows that like 72, seven, like say 72 out of 256 va uh, values are like strike first or something like that. And so it, it has an idea. It's like, okay, you're on this value. And then based on this value, I know that holding this button, this button, and this button gives you a ho the highest chance of not getting a back attack. So it's, it's not 100%. Here I'm going to pause again to do more stuff with the in-game timer. Uh, Edward faces his zombie girlfriend, who is encouraging him to beat the water hag. And what's funny about this, in the normal playthrough, you only have the harp on Edward. And in order to trigger um, any this fight to progress, you actually have to hit the water hag. And with the harp, Edward's accuracy is actually pretty terrible. And so, um, in a casual playthrough, um, if he misses twice and then the water hag decides to hit Edward for high damage, this, your game can end right here. But because we have the dancing dagger and Edward is in the middle row, and, um, he's basically guaranteed to hit. I think there's a 1% chance of missing. So one of the weird quirks of this game is that the middle row has higher accuracy than the other, the other slots for whatever reason. That's just a interesting programming quirk. I don't really know any reasoning behind that. Um, also, when calculating who gets their turn, the basically turn priority is also based on what slot that characters are in. And so you're going to see me moving characters into specific formations all throughout this run. Uh, mostly because back row takes less damage than front row and so on and so forth. In front row you do more damage and that kind of thing. But some of them are uh, completely for ATB order reasons. And same thing as before, you walk out left, you end up on the left side of this town. It saves a couple steps. So I know that they modified this game a lot for the US release. Uh, not only with some of the translation decisions, but also they actually made the game a bit easier. Does that actually play into the speed run? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, SN uh, the Japanese version of this game and the US version of this game are entirely different speed runs. Um, I would actually argue that the US version is a little bit more difficult just because they took so much out of this game for the US release. Uh, for example, just about every character in this game has an extra skill in the Japanese version. For example, Cecil has Dark Wave, uh, Rydia has... What does Rydia have? I'm not sure what she has. And then Edward has, like, Salve. And um, that's, you'll see that a lot. Like, if you've played the PSP version of this game, or, like, the DS version of this game, uh, all, all those skills are still in there. But in the, US, in the SNES, the original release of this, all those skills are nerfed. And uh, so that, that basically, um, they also removed a whole bunch of items, like any of the spell casting items are, are not in the game in, the, in this version, but they are in the game in the, the uh, Japanese version. And it really kind of limits what you can do. Um, they also reduce the HP of enemies, so um, it's a little bit um, compensated in that way, but you're really kind of, I guess, nerfed in the combat strategy compared to, say, the uh, the Japanese version. The, str the strats are going to be entirely different. And I guess that's because they thought the U.S. couldn't handle the strategy. I don't really know. Shoutouts to, uh, yeah, early or 
early to mid 90s Japan or Japanese games, a lot of them did get major changes coming to the US. And or games made just for the US in the case of Mystic Quest. <laughs> That's true. So here we have uh, Yang. Um, he has a fight that I have absolutely no control over here. He's going to miss the back one and then kick and kill all three. Um, uh, and I know that because of the damage rolls, I think. Am I right? Yeah, okay. Right. Um, this is a fight I have no control over. His kick can, uh, can kill one right off the bat. Um, he can actually leave two alive, and this takes five turns. Ideally, what we want to see is a three-turn fight. Um, that's a little less than ideal because he didn't kill an imp with his second attack, but it, it's definitely uh, acceptable. So here, um, uh, sorry, uh, Mom Bomb has 800 hit points, so I'm going to count damage. Uh, I've done 400 so far, give or take. Um, so 460, this needs to do 340, or I need to throw this. There it is. Okay. And so now Mom Bomb's going to explode into six bombs and do a ton of damage to my party. I'm going to queue up a kick for the bombs when they spawn. Yang will have a nice surprise ready for them. Wow, that took a lot of damage. Ooh, terrible damage all around. So Yang's kick can do anywhere from uh, 30, like 10 to 32. He did like 17 as his highest damage roll. So ideally, Rosa kills this orange bomb here, but she's going to have to hit it super hard. Uh, almost. She did her best. So after Mom Bomb explodes, um, it's basically Rydia and Edward take out the Grey Bombs with 100 hit points. And these bombs, I believe, have somewhere around like 50 hit points, give or take. And um, so fortunately, Rydia and Edward are able to plow through, and Cecil and Yang can basically clean up the rest. So that was a pretty good fight. Pretty good sequence. I should be on pretty good pace right now, actually. Do uh, you want to know your time right now? I'm going to guess 36.45. Very close, 36.40. Okay. Not 45. That's not bad. And so we move on. Um, this upcoming walk on the world map um, from the end of this mountain to the town of Fabul has uh, the highest encounter rate in the game. And so this is where step routes really come into play. Uh, you're, you're probably going to see me get into a ton of encounters on the way to Fabul here. Um, and the best step routes get like maybe one or two encounters on this entire walk, whereas I will probably see six or seven. Which is an unfortunate... Um, <laughs> Fortunate side effect of not having a step row, but not the end of the world. So upcoming we have um, the Fabul fights, which are, are basically you take the male members of your party, uh, Edward, Cecil, and Yang, and you do seven fights in a row that are pretty scary, all things considered. Especially because Edward doesn't have too high hit points. So I'm actually going to safety save for Marathon. Marathon strats. And Edward is still one of your primary damage dealers because oh, of yes. the daggers, right? Yeah, so Edward is actually the primary uh, damage dealer in all of these fights because of those dancing daggers. And uh, Cecil and Yang are basically there for to eat the damage and clean up whatever Edward doesn't do. So here we return to the king. Yang's like, oh man, all my monks got destroyed. Baron's come on their way, gonna destroy us all. And he's like, really? And then Edward's like, yeah, damn, see, I got blown up too. And he's like, oh, okay. I better, I better trust you guys then. And so Rosa and Rydia are gonna go heal everybody in the the hospital. <clears throat> Excuse me. While uh, these three fight on the front lines. So this is the first real use. You saw me do it in Mom Bomb. This is the first important usage of the camera buffer. Um, so I have to get that dancing dagger off before the dialogue disappears. Otherwise, the fighters will get their turn uh, before I get 
before Edward throws that Dancing Dagger. And if they want to troll me, these fighters can just hit Edward for... Sorry, didn't kill. Good job, guys. That's unfortunate. It's a little bit of wasted time. Okay, so um, as I was saying, uh, those soldiers can hit Edward for um, basically 93 damage if they really want to. And one of the quirks about Edward is he will auto-hide if, if he's an HP critical. And that basically makes him more than uh, more useless than when he's, when he's dead. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, you basically want it. Every fight, if Edward takes damage, you're always cringing. Like, oh no! Because he is the primary damage dealer. So ideally, uh, the guard fights... Um, oh, perfect damage bomb. The guard fights, Edward will kill um, a soldier, and then the other soldier will probably get an attack. That's unless I have super good ATB rules. And then ideally the soldier doesn't hit Edward, or it hits Edward for a small amount of damage. So Yang has the potential to one-shot a guard if he decides to roll high, and so that's good. The inventory looks relatively good. Move that life down a little bit. And for the longest time, uh, the full sequence was always a struggle before we l learned about camera buffering just because these enemies do so much damage and if they hit Edward, you know, you're just kind of screwed, basically. And so um, this was a pain point in the run for a very long time. I remember during the limit break race, I believe two of you guys had Edward run something like that. So. Yeah, and even then, like, even with the buffer, it's still possible to you know, take damage like this. Sometimes you just don't get the rolls. So here in this final fight of the sequence, I'm going to be duping Yang's Claw. Um, and I specifically need a, um, a specific number of Fire Claws for a, a glitch near the end of the game. Ooh, that was a little slow. That's okay. All right, so that's done. I hold off on Cecil's attack there in the event that Yang does kill the guard in one hit. Yay! And so, the football uh, fights are done. Um, just one final fight with our good buddy Kane, who um, is under the control of Golbez now. And uh, there's basically two outcomes to this fight, where um, I, Kane either does a lot of damage and it's the fight ends very quickly because Kane did a lot of damage. I'm also going to hit myself in order to try and assist that to happen. Uh oh. There we go, Cecil came through. So if Cecil is in critical, uh, Kane will say got you, jump on you, and then the fight will end like this. Or um, if Cecil isn't in critical and there's like two or three lines of dialogue and then you have to sit through a perished, like the typical game over perished dialogue box. And so that wastes about 15 to 20 seconds. Uh, I'm gonna say 43.50 for that right about now. And maybe even 44.10. Uh, it's 43.35. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright, so pretty good run so far. I figured all those encounters would, uh, would have bit me, but I guess not. But that's okay. All that can come crashing down in the next uh, upcoming sequence here. Time for a couple quick donations? Oh, absolutely. We have a $5 donation from Steel Feathers saying, Had a great time getting to watch so many runs in person. Shoutouts to Ghoul02, turning locator and all the runners for making a DFW event possible and benefiting an awesome cause. I'm hopeful for, the f for future events, but let's aim for that 1K mark. Thank you very much. We also have an anonymous $15 donation. So, again, we're getting really close, guys. We're at... 925, we're 75 off. Let's get there.
So if I were doing step route, this is a place where the, the specific tiles that I walk on matter. For example, right there, I walked on the red carpet. Those don't count towards the step counter, whereas the brown tiles I'm walking on right now do. Um, and it's just a you know, one of those minor things where you can take extra steps without actually going out of your way to take extra steps towards the step counter. So fun little thing. So here I'm going to um, finish the dupe in the menu, um, which will give me a stack of 255, or 254 fire claws, and I'm also going to equip that black sword that I just received. So here's the dupe finish, and there we go. And let's get the black sword on, and we are on our way. So I hope you enjoyed your time with Edward and Rydia and Yang, because uh, they're going for a little bit of a swim. So the upcoming town of Mysidia, which is the town we raided in the very beginning of the game, um, is where I will do the better majority of my shopping for the run. I'll pick up a whole bunch of usable items as well as a bunch of armor. And um, I will be buying a specific number of these items just to um, set up for a glitch later. This whole run basically revolves around one particular glitch near the end of the game. Um, there's already been a lot of minor setup done. For example, I parked a hovercraft in a very specific place, which, um, which is important for setting up the glitch. I already mentioned game time as well. And so um, just a lot of little things go into um, setting up this glitch to where it won't crash while you're trying to go through. And um, the setup for this was originally found by a tool-assisted speedrunner in the Japanese community by the name of Pirohiko. Um, this glitch is actually known about for a very long time. There's actually a um, an old article, I believe it was like, I don't remember what it was called, the Ogopogo Examiner, that's what it was called, which was a Nintendo newsletter, and um, it talks about how if you walk up and down stairs 64 times, Zero Mission might come and get you, and you have to restart your game. So um, it's, it, it's basically a bug that got past the, uh, the, uh, the dev team, I guess. And, but uh, fortunately, um, Pure Hiko was able to determine a way to set it up to where it's usable in a speedrun sense. And then I believe Brosentia, as well as No Cash, No Cash, and The Roth really started ironing out a route that was uh, real time viable. So, there's our buddy Leviathan. It's not Leviathan, his name's Leviathan in this one. Uh, you may have noticed him. He's he's got a cameo from his Final Fi Final Fantasy 15. That's his original game. He's making a cameo here in Final Fantasy 4. So we wake up on a beach. Uh, everybody's gone. We didn't sink to the bottom of the ocean with our armor somehow. Don't ask me how. I don't know. And it's shopping time. Oh, get out of my way. Jerk. So depending on where the NPCs are, either walk up or right. I'm actually going to walk right because that white mage was kind of in my way for going up. That's a lot of money. Sure is. <laughs> So there, um, I bought basically all the healing items I'll need for the rest of the run, as well as sold 140 Fire Claws to get a stack of 114. Um, that's a very specific value that I need um, for later on. 
So here we have Palom and Porom, the source of grief for any speedrun of this game. <laughs> um, Palom and Porom have a skill called Twin, where they have a 75% chance to cast Flare and a 25% chance to cast Comet. Uh, Flare is the one we want in a speedrun sense, but they love casting Comet. Um, on top of that, there's also a glitch called the Carrot and uh, Carrot and Trash Clan glitch, or the Twin Mimic glitch, where uh, the twins will actually... You can trick the twins to mimicking other party members' actions and have them use items that normally can't be usable. And what that does is it allows us to... Um, it allows us to use items, and for whatever reason, they're coded as very high-level spells and can uh, do a lot of damage, but it requires so much setup. Uh, I am going to try and go for it, just because, why not? It's it's faster, ideally, but um, chances are I'm not going to get it. So I believe... Uh, you said trash cans, so that's the incentive that you had on Limit Break as well, right? Uh, correct. That's the incentive that set me back 10 minutes at Limit Break, yes. <laughs> cool. Let's hope for some good luck this time. Yeah, that was basically the worst possible outcome of that what happened at Limit Break. Yeah. And so, um, there, there's a back attack. So these guys are, I will cast Fire 1, which actually wastes a lot of time. But... In this scenario, I really want them to hit the top twin. Yes, good, good, because I, I need to kill her later on. Um, and the more damage she's taken, the more higher the chance is that I kill her. Uh, having Palom die is kind of crappy, though. I'll have to revive him later. So for those that might not know, this was done as a... this Not this specific category, but Final Fantasy IV was a four-way race uh, at RPG Limit Break, which was a... Uh, RPG focused speedrunning marathon. Uh, it was a pretty awesome. It was pretty awesome. Uh, I thought so. Yeah. Four runners, very high level. You guys had great commentary on the side done by uh, it was Bic and it was Batman and Robin. <laughs> that's right. It was uh, yeah, it was Bic. It was Bic and, and the Feral Big Man. Bic Fong Balls and Feral Big Man. Yes. Um, and then this this game uh, was also the. Uh, closer for Awesome Games Done Quick this year by No Cash No Cash, who put in a very good run. All right. I think the only other, the only other American fun run I can think of was the SGDQ 13 run by Brosentia. Are yeah. there any others? Um, I've run this in a couple of smaller marathons here and there, and I believe Roth has run it in a couple of the Australian marathons as well. But uh, those are the high ticket ones for sure. I've run this at DeuceCon twice now, as well as um, Fast Fair, which is coming up again next weekend, and I'll be doing the same thing. Alright, so here we run back into our old buddy Tella, who's on this mountain searching for power. He's, he's like, something's weird about this mountain, there's like a zombie there. There's got to be something going on. If at all possible, could you turn up the game audio in my headset? Oh. One sec. Because I don't hear it at all right now. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. So this upcoming fight is uh, very, very tight. Um, it's a strat that I, I actually discovered. Um, Pirohiko does... Oh my gosh, another one. Pirohiko does it in his uh, tool-assisted speedrun, and I came up with a way to make it RCA viable, but man, does it suck. <laughs> Hit the top one. Yes, my hero. So with 79 hit points, she's basically guaranteed to die, which is good. I will be safety saving, so I'm going to lose a little bit of time to that. Oh, wow, three in a row. That's not cool. If only it was two goals, then I can blame you, but it's three. <laughs> That's right, I got a couple friends. I see, I see. 
A couple, not too many. Yo, four in a row. <laughs> Do different uh, enemy groups have a higher chance of that, or is that just... It is based off of average party level, and then I believe each encounter has an average level as well. And so the higher... Uh, I, I think... I'm not 100% sure on this, but the higher level of the party, or the uh, enemy encounter, the, basically the higher chance it is. Oh, okay, I have to do a lot of healing here. This is unfortunate. I actually should have did that a little bit differently, but whatever. Um, don't want to heal you. I do want to heal you, I guess. Let's do this. Let's do one of these. Oh, oops. So a lot of that inventory stuff I did uh, earlier um, basically comes into play right there instead of having to like scroll all over my menus to try and get all that set up. Uh, everything was nice and near the top and I can just equip everything very, very quickly. Alright, let's do this. So I'm going to do this trick and then if it works I'll explain it. little concern. And so what happened there is uh, because Porum died as she was casting Twin, Palum started mimicking uh, other party members. And I'm going to be doing the same thing here, just a slightly different setup. I shouldn't have done that, that's fine. A lot of things can go wrong in this fight. So I'm not going to be able to use Trash Can uh, because Cecil died early. Um, so I'm going to be reverting to, I guess, what nor are basically normal strats, um, where I hope for flares from the Twins. Uh, they can do anywhere from basically 600 to 1100 damage. I want Cecil alive to tank some damage. I'm actually going to heal him just to be super safe. Can I want to heal off this before it ticks? Alright, there we go. So a little unfortunate there, but not the end of the world. I'm getting I'm getting good luck from the twins, regard uh, despite um Oh, she's dead. I'll just cure two out, that's fine. I got two two flares, halfway decent damage rolls. I should be able to just cure, throw two cures on him and he'll die eventually. Oop, not you. So for that setup, I actually messed up two things. Um, I messed up the timing on uh, the Ice 2 as well as the uh, Cecil dying, so that's okay. I'm alive. Um, 
59. No, I had a lot of back attacks. I'm going to do one hour, 20 seconds. 59, 42 when you were saying that, so. Okay. Not terrible. The four back attacks really kind of killed any excitement I might have had about this run, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, all those ghouls, man. So here we have the fight where Cecil is this mysterious light, a.k.a. Cecil's father is talking to him, and he drops this sword on him, and Cecil be turns into this paladin guy. And normally, this is basically a cutscene battle where you're not supposed to do anything. You're supposed to stand there and defend or, you know, do whatever, and then he gives you a speech about being just, or justice is not the only right in this world, blah, 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 blah. But really, uh, true paladins have a different idea of how to approach becoming, defeating your inner darkness. Oops, I did that a little backwards. That's fine. High damage roll, I can kill him in three. So true paladins just destroy their inner darkness with dancing daggers. Not sure if you knew that, but now you do. So now we have Cecil as a paladin, and then Tell is also going to remember all the spells he forgot, which is like every spell in the game. So apparently Tella was super amazing, awesome at one point, but then he decided to like... I don't really know. There's no legitimate reason for him to forget, other than he's old, quote-unquote. And why he remembers there. So, to note, uh, you guys, this is considered a race category as well, I believe, right? Just to get to when Cecil becomes a paladin? Yes, You so guys had a very large tournament for this as well, yeah, I believe. Yeah, we had... I don't... I remember the FF6 one was 80 people. I think this one was, I want to say, 70 people, where um, we had races up to this point in the game where Cecil becomes a paladin, um, and there was it was a 70-person tournament, and I believe Fathlo23 is the one who won that tournament. Um, but Roth, who I mentioned as the record holder, was second, and I was third. Um, and it's it's an interesting category to learn, or a race category to learn, just because it, it doesn't get into the nitty, like, the super difficult stuff is further on in the run. And um, if you're looking to speedrun an RPG, uh, Final Fantasy IV, the whole run itself is pretty, like, I guess I would say new person friendly, uh, easy to learn, hard to master kind of thing. Um, it's, it's a very, I guess from an RPG standpoint, it's like a very, you know, standard RPG um, menuing um, most of it most of the focus in this game focuses on boss battles and your strategies within them whereas other RPGs there's a lot of like movement and menuing and um, menu optimization and not to say that there isn't menu optimization in this run there most certainly is but um, it's definitely a great starting point if you want to learn any kind of speedrunning. If you want to speedrun an RPG and you've got nostalgia for this game and you're like, oh, this looks interesting, then I would definitely say go for it. I'm actually going to do a save and reset here, and this is to manipulate um, the direction the chocobo goes when I dismount it, believe it or not. And this is going to be important, so I'm going to reset. Okay, cool. We're good. Okay, good. <laughs> see if I remember how to do this. Alright, good. So, for whatever reason, uh, the game stores the uh, coordinates of where the chocobo leaves the screen when you dismount, and lo and behold, that's important to the glitch that I'm going to be doing later. So, uh, shoutouts to arbitrary things mattering. Yep, that's good. So now we're a paladin. All these people in this town hated you, but then you become a paladin. They're like, oh, well, he must be the hero. And he redeemed himself. And he's like, Cecil's like, I heard this this story. Now this is a story all about how I became a paladin somehow. I, oh. And so this legend is repeated many times throughout the game. 
good, well-translated legend. So, fun fact about the translations of the Final Fantasy series. Um, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Ted Wolstein, who uh, did the translations for uh, Final Fantasy VI or three in the U.S., as well as Chrono Trigger. And uh, when they hired him, they showed him the dialogue from this game and says, don't repeat this. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did not know that. Yeah, th this was this was their reasoning behind hiring him. They were like, this is too bad, this is too terrible, we can't let this happen again. Actually, it was surprising I went back and looked. Uh, this game came out surprisingly early in the SNES lifetime. Uh, I thought it came out a lot later when I was doing some research into it. So. I believe this was the first Super Nintendo RPG to yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain. So. I want to say it came out within the first year. Yeah. Um, if you've played Final Fantasy III on the NES, uh, the one that did not get a, um, a release, um, there are a lot of very similar mechanics. I missed it. <laughs> oh. So every, every time an event triggers, if you swap right at, on the right frame, you can actually swap to a different character, but their palette doesn't swap, so... You can actually get different colored characters, and it looks really cool, but uh, not today, apparently. So here I'm going to be fighting some guards and then fighting our karate friend. And then after that um, is the more important thing of... I'm going to be doing, I think, the rest of the... I don't do any more shopping for the rest of the run. And... Um, all the items I need to set up all of the different glitches I'm going to be doing, I'm going to buy in the Baron Weapon Shop. But first, this guy. These guards are pretty easy to get rid of. Oh, bad ATV roll. Terrible ATV roll. Yep, they both got turns. Um, here, I want to take the Change Rod off of Palum and actually give it to Tella. And Porum dying is actually super good, because now I can... Uh, do it in this fight. Normally I would have to parry to tell it in the next fight and then do it there, but now I have a lot of free time to maybe clear a little bit of inventory space during, during his kicks. So this is a scripted fight. You might be like, oh, he's gonna die, but um, Yang will always... Um, die to Cecil's fight uh, after he's kicked twice, so that's the only way to end this fight. Um, you can actually kill Yang, I guess. Uh, he has like he has something like 43,000 hit points or something. It's ridiculous. But um, it's a scripted battle, so um, Cecil can even miss Yang and he still dies right there. It's pretty funny when that happens. You mentioned earlier that each of the party slots has a different accuracy, so the center is more accurate. Does it just get less accurate as you go to the outside? Um, it's only the center. The center is 125% accurate, and then I think the rest are 100%. So it's only the center slot specifically. There's a lot of funky back row things, too. Like, back row um, halves accuracy, but only in certain situations. And then if you equip a weapon that has... Um, 100% accuracy from the back row, you lose your ability to crit, and there's all kinds of really weird bugs in this game. Do these, are these in the Japanese version as well, or is it just the US version? Um, I think they're in the Japanese version. I can't say for sure. So as I mentioned here, um, you're going to see me buying a lot of items that's going to look super weird. Oh. This first shop, not so much. This is This is strictly for armor purposes. Alright, here I need... No, not those. These. 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 Oh, not two of those. Alright, I'm gonna, definitely going to have to save. Alright, so I bought extra stuff there by accident. Um, that might screw me up later, but I, I'll be able to safety save uh, immediately prior. So it won't be too big of a deal if it does, because I can adjust... Uh, just uh, bad menuing, really, on my behalf. So this cave has some of the worst back attacks in the entire run. 
Uh, you notice those crocodiles, they hit twice, and when they surprise or back attack you, they usually get two turns as well, so it's really pretty terrible. Yeah, so the, well, he, that crocodile alone got four attacks in this fight. Well, Tella died. Impressive. I don't think I've had that happen in a long time. Uh, I'm not really in too much danger of dying in these caves, it's just danger of losing a lot of time to back attacks, because uh, the crocodiles get two attacks, uh, so do the alligators if you see them. And then there's also an enemy called the Aqua Worm, which I hope we don't see, that will cast Wave in the event of a back attack. This is probably the worst one in the cave, so shoutouts to FF4. FF4 does not seem to like marathon runs lately. <laughs> At least for the ones I've seen. I don't know. I guess I didn't watch all that much of the MDVD run, but... Two marathon runs I've seen have not had great luck with that. Oh, we didn't attack twice. That's good. So this is another scenario where if I was on step route, I could, I would potentially not get too many encounters in here. I believe the ideal step route, I believe, only gets one encounter in this entire sequence through these, these uh, the barren waterway here. Obviously, I'm on encounter like five or something, so... Not ideal. Uh, having uh, Porum die is kind of a good thing, though, because I was going to kill her off in the next boss battle anyway. Um, so we've reached a point in the run where um, some people have left the party, such as Rydia, Kane, um, Yang is back, but Rosa as well. And they're actually in what's called a shadow party, uh, where any experience I gain, they are gaining the same amount. And what's interesting about that is it's not being split between them. So if I kill a boss with one character alive, uh, they'll get all the experience from that boss. Say, like, Bygen gives, like, 6,000. I don't, actually don't know how much Bygen gives. Um, that means each each of those other characters I listed will also get 6,000 uh, experience. But if I get, like, if I have all my characters alive, that would be, like, 1,200. And so each Kane, Radia, Rosa would get 1,200. So it's I it's ideal to kill off characters to maximize the amount of experience the other the uh, Shadow Party is getting. Um, I don't want to heal. I actually do. I lied. So if a unit isn't alive, they don't get the experience from the fight, and that just gets redistributed to the, to the uh, members that are alive then. Correct. Um, that's it right now. Um, I need to do this now so I don't forget later. Okay, good. I thought I forgot something, but I didn't. <laughs> Whew. That might be the most quiet speedrun noise I've ever heard. Like, <laughs> like a giant inhale instead of like the raptor noises you hear from other people or something else. So I, I did a glitch there that I haven't described yet, uh, and that is underflowing uh, Tella's MP pool. You'll see why in just a second. little spell called Medium. Oh, he's dead. Sweet. So normally, Tella has a max MP of 90, and Medium takes 99 MP to cast. Uh, we don't have that problem here. Boop. So Cecil was level 1 going into this fight, so he's going to gain a billion levels. Uh, two people alive. Um, obviously getting more experience there. Uh, I'm going to pick up Yang here. Um, for whatever reason, having Yang alive... Uh, Cecil has enough agility now, and Yang being alive is going to... Oh shoot, I forgot one thing. Oh, I forgot two things. I lied. So if I execute this properly, um, Keinazo... <laughs> Alright, I'm being safe here. <laughs> if I execute this properly, Keinazo will not get a wave off. Um, ideally at all. Um, if Tella's damage roll is bad, he'll get a wave off that will be significantly weakened. So, let's see if I can do it. Should be okay. Good damage from Yang. 
So ideally, Tela's Lit 3 here will kill Kainazo, and this is quite possible in a casual run as well. Yeah, good, really good damage roll. So it needs to do 4,000 uh, 4, minus whatever damage I did in the beginning there. And that was actually a super good roll, so I'm just gonna clear out some inventory stuff. Oh, I missed the last one. Alright. Uh, 113.50. 115.09. 115, whoa. Those back attacks cost me way more than I thought they did. Yeah, the alligator back attacks and stuff, I mean, I guess probably pushed you back like, quite a bit. Dang. Oh well. It's a marathon run. It's expected. I guess I've been doing a couple of little things that are safer than normal. So here we have our sixth party member, Sid. Uh, you'll prior to this in the Bygen fight, Bygen quote unquote joins the party, but then Palomo Forum are like, no, 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 this guy's evil. And you're like, ah, oh, I guess, I guess you're right. So now we have Sid in the party, so we have six members again, and uh, the game does not like having six members in your party at any point in time. So Kainazo's final trap is to lock you in this room. In order to stop the walls from crushing everybody, the uh, the twins petrify themselves and the walls stop. And Tella tries to heal them, but because they did it of their own will, he can't be healed. My theory is Tella's actually the one that petrified them because he's the only one who knows the ability to petrify things, <laughs> and then just fakes this heal cast. Nope. I can't heal them because uh, they did it themselves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, let's get out of here. Let's go kill Golbez. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is one of the longest cutscenes in the game. So. All right. Uh, as a reminder, uh, getting closer to the end of this uh, marathon. This is race to the finish. We are raising money for Cook's Children's. Uh, again, we are at 925. We're 75 off that $1,000 mark. So, get those donations in. Um, uh, yeah. So story-wise, um, we just killed, uh, two of the four elemental fiends, Mylon being the fiend of earth, uh, Kainazo being the fiend of water, who was disguised as the king of Baron. Um, and then we picked up Sid, who is an engineer and the one who made all the airships, and he's got this airship stashed away, casually. I've been working on this in my spare time kind of thing. So we, now we have an airship, which is good. And so this would be the point in the game where I would have been able to get the mist and buy the dancing daggers uh, if this were a normal playthrough. So getting those early uh, was really nice. Uh, Story-wise, um, Golbez has three of the four crystals, but the last crystal is being held by a dark elf with uh, substantial magic power. And so Golbez is like, hmm, how am I going to do this? And so Kane has this bright idea. Let's make Cecil do it and trade. We'll trade the crystal for Rosa, and we'll be good. And so that's what we're doing. Coming up here, uh, I have to land by the town of Troya, uh, which is um, there is one cell that I can land on. Uh, doing it full speed is called the MLG landing. I haven't missed it in about 10 runs, so I'm very due to completely whiff it. Here we go. Ah, oh, I knew it. <laughs> Rip. So you can't match that because it'll try to go down early then too, huh? Yeah. Oh well. You win some, you lose some. 
So another uh, point of manipulation that people are working on, specifically myself 086, um, is if you watch the direction the frogs are moving, uh, you can actually determine where the black chocobo is going to be in the forest in um, just a little bit here. Which is some crazy, crazy manipulation, but somehow... I don't even know how he thinks of half the stuff he thinks of, but he does it. So here, um, Edward, uh, we find him after the terrifying Leviathan attack. Um, they're sad that they couldn't that they couldn't save Rydia, but Edward's too mangled to do anything. Or he's t he's too uh, too tired. But he drops us his mixtape. Um, that's gonna see us through. So here, um, you're gonna see this a lot. It's faster to cast exit to get out of places than it is to actually walk out. Uh, in the majority of circumstances at this point. So I'm going to be exiting out of a lot of places. And in order to get to the Dark Elf Cave, uh, because you can't land anywhere over there with the airship, you actually have to grab a black chocobo and fly over there. So you all get to laugh as I struggle to try and catch one. Here we go. Come here, come here. No. No. Come back here. Alright, that works. Cornered him. So the difference is that a black chocobo can fly and that a yellow one cannot then? Correct. Okay. Ooh, hello. So this cave has a lot of bad encounters, um, a lot of bat encounters, if you will. And uh, one of the special properties of this cave is um, instead of being, like, having super high difficulty and just a large number of enemies. Um, anybody with metallic equipment will actually be permanently paralyzed. And so, uh, of my current party, Sid is actually the only one who does not have a, any metallic equipment on because he joins the party with a hammer and basically prisoner gear, which, uh, a wooden hammer. And so he's actually the only one capable of taking any actions. Uh, however, the ability to run away is still based off of the party member that has the highest agility, and in this scenario, it's Cecil. Um, his agility is the highest in the party, so I need Cecil alive to be able to run away from enemies and not take an attack or two. Unless it's a strike first, of course, then I can run away. And um, there's a couple of nasty encounters in here. Uh, bats are one. Uh, they're bad because they just spam vampire, which is a laggy spell, and it just takes forever. Um, the worst one to see is two mages. Um, two mages have an ability called Blast. Um, they'll each get an opportunity to use it, and what Blast does is it'll paralyze one party member. And if that party member happens to be Sid, I have to sit there and watch, watch uh, them cast a whole bunch of spells and wait for him to be unparalyzed again, hopefully, and hopefully be able to run away in that time frame. It's quite possible for them to continue to chain paralyzes on Sid, and I just can't do anything, and uh, if that happens, it's just really, really unfortunate, but kind of the nature of the beast. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, this is what you don't want to see. Fortunately, this isn't the worst one, but it's pretty bad. So yeah, we had to sit through all those vampires. Um, just not cool. Rather unfortunate, if you will. No. Okay. So a mage in an encounter like this, um, they won't cast a blast unless they're by themselves, which is good. Alright, we made it through. So here, um, you may have noticed way back in the beginning of the game, I actually equipped unequipped uh, Kane's Iron Glove. And I actually need to do more than that, don't I? I'm gonna be rearranging my party order. Yeah, that's okay. And so I equip it on Sid here, and so he has a piece of metallic equipment. Everybody's got metallic equipment, and I instantly die. And yeah, it's game over. Good game. And so what that does is uh, actually saves a whole bunch of time. Uh, because I, what happens in that fight normally is that uh, you get into the fight, you kind of try and hit him, you, you do like no damage to him, and then he just blasts you with fire three, ice three, lit three combo that takes forever to cast, and then 
um, you die, and then this cutscene happens. So we just speed it along by ha making everybody have metallic equipment, and it just ends the fight instantly. And so it saves us probably about a good minute. And so Edward uh, firing up his mixtape from afar, dropping his sweet jams. Dark Elf is so enthralled with his jams. From an island away in the inside this giant dark cave. Yep. And so the magnetic field drops, and for whatever reason, the party is fully healed as well. Go, go, plot. And we beat him up. Alright, that should be good timing. Uh, I'm going to kill Sid here, um, because I need the experience to be higher. Do that. Fellow's gonna blow him up. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, Dark Elf's gonna cast weak on somebody. I want it to be Yang. Dang. So after 2,000 damage, Dark Elf turns into this Dark Dragon, and for whatever reason, this dragon is weak to the, the weak spell. And so, uh, what weak does is it will, um, weak will drop a target to single digit hit points, as you saw on Cecil, and so it really trivializes the end of that fight, and we get through. Important note, if you're ever playing this game, pick up this crystal, do not just leave. Many speedruns and many casual runs have been thwarted by that. And so we can't cast Exit in the Crystal Room, but we can cast Exit from right here, so we have to walk out. I actually should have healed Cecil in that menu. I'll do it in just a second, though. Well, I should do it now. And yeah, I'll be fine. So here, um, I have to catch another Black Chocobo um, and park it in a very specific location. Um, and I'm not going to get him. No! Oh my goodness. <laughs> the jukes. Oh my gosh. I gotcha. Alright. We did it. So you might be thinking, why is he parking way out there? Trust me, it's important. Yo, we did it. Didn't have to heal. All right, so now um, we talk to the um, Troya, I guess, maidens. And they're like, oh, wow, you did it. You got the crystal from the Dark Elf. Congratulations. Give it back to us. And we're like, well, you see, we actually uh, are using, we got blackmailed into doing this, sorry. And then they're just like, dang. And they leave. I'm going to take the time to heal Cecil right here. Once again, exiting out is faster. Alright, so now when you jump into the airship, for whatever reason, Kane's like, oh, hey, he got the thing. And <laughs> airship crash. No. And so you're automatically teleported to the Tower of Zot. Which I believe. Um, doesn't necessarily have a location on the map itself, but I believe it's inferred that it's basically the top floor of the Tower of Babel, which is by Eblin, but I don't know for sure. And of course, we can't just go straight to Golbez, we have to walk through all this, uh, all his monsters and stuff, and, yeah, it's no fun. Uh, this... This tower, um, I don't think there's any encounters that have more than four enemies, but the enemies in here hit super hard, and so I have to be wary of making sure that I have enough hit points to survive any back potential back attacks. Um, it won't be so such a problem right now, but in a little bit, probably. We're going to be picking up a weapon here. This is a monster in a box. Um, 
this can this will get me the fire sword, but in order to get the fire sword, I need to beat this this flame dog, and he actually hurts. A lot of runs die to this guy. That's kind of a good thing. Ideally, I'd want him to die, but Cease is gonna cover for him. Whatever. Oh, that's not what I wanted. So now I'm going to have the Fire Sword, and I'm also going to um, Underflow Tella's Magic eventually, there we go, for the upcoming battle. That's the next boss battle, which is the Magus Sisters. But for now, we have a long walk ahead of us. Let's see. So did that reset somewhere? Because you did underflow that earlier as well, right? Yes. So um, in order to actually cast uh, exit in the menu or any spells in the menu, um, you have to basically reset his MP by using an ether on him. And I did that between Bygen and Kainazo, um in order to be able in order to be able to use spells in the menu. In battle, he's fine, but. In the menu, not so much. So what, what I'm hoping happens in this upcoming fight is that Yang dies, and I actually don't think I'm going to have enough experience to get to where I want, so I might try and kill Cecil off as well. Problem is, Cecil has a ton of hit points. I shouldn't have healed him, now that I think about it. So I might be a little low on experience for Kane compared to where I want to be, and that'll actually change my ATB for the upcoming boss battle um, a little bit and make it a little more difficult for me. Ideally, Yang would have died in the Flame Dog fight, but he took um, took a little too much damage from the first attack on the Flame Dog, so a little bit unfortunate, but not the end of the world. Of course, if Cecil takes a lot of damage here, I have a shot. Nope. On one hand, it's a good thing because I don't have to heal. On the other hand, So I'm underflowed, I'm ready to go. Let's beat up some Magus Sisters. And so this fight is basically the first opportunity I'll have to set up the inventory for the glitch. Uh, if the fight goes the way I want it to. But there is a pretty high chance that it will not. Don't hit Tella, you jerk. So now I have to cure to him, otherwise he has the potential of dying. Oh, come on, Yang. <laughs> Was that a really low damage roll, or could he, did he have too much health there? He probably had too much health. Yang's not the best in the world. Uh, Cecil took the damage. Alright, I'm definitely not getting uh, the level I want. Alright, let me see. 2 for 5 right here. figure it out later. Unfortunate, um, so my Valvolus fight is going to look ugly. Not much I can do about that. Alright, so this is the point in the run. Um, in an 064 route, we're about halfway through. Um, we're about three quarters of the way through now. Um, if you ever need to take a break during this run, this, this upcoming fight is the ideal spot to do it. Um, for me... Um, for the any percent run, this is where um, you basically evaluate where you if you need to pause or not, and then try and figure out where you are. Uh, based on the 115.09 mark, I should probably be pausing a lot, especially because um, this upcoming fight isn't going to go that hot. And of course, Tello is going to cast Medio, but uh, because he doesn't, because he doesn't have um, the Underflow, it's going to kill him. He's spending his life. Oops. 
Definitely hasn't cast that about a hundred times. No, 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 no. Either. And so Golbez is dead. We win. Matella dies. And fun thing with the sound, you can actually pause on fade out so the sound gets reduced. <laughs> fun little glitch. So Tella mediated Golbez, but Golbez is like, eh, no big deal. I got the crystal, I don't care. I still got my lightning bolts. Fuck me. So ideally, I'd want Kane to rejoin the party at level 19, uh, but because Yang survived both the Flame Dog fight and the Maga Sisters fight, which is incredibly rare, um, Kane is going to join the party at level 18, and that's unfortunate because uh, Kane gets an attack mul damage multiplier at level 19, and also he gets some agility. So not only is he going to be doing less damage than he normally is, he's also going to be slower, and that's quite unfortunate. Um, but. It is what it is. So that changes what I have to do in this fight uh, by a little bit. But hopefully it, it's not as ugly as I think it's going to go. So fun fact, in the Japanese version of this game, that is not a giant boulder slash bowling ball slash what have you. It is actually a guillotine, or a guillotine. <laughs> and so the uh, Nintendo censorship felt like, oh, it's more humane to get crushed by a giant boulder than it is to have be cut by a guillotine. <laughs> For whatever reason. Don't ask me why, I don't know. Mortal Kombat sweat. Yes. So we saved Rosa, Kane's spell was broken by the Meteo, and so we get these two in our party. Kane does a ton of damage, uh, thanks to the levels that we have on him, as well as the Fire Sword that we picked up. I'm actually going to be duping uh, what's called the Half Dupe, where I'm going to be duping one more of the Fire Sword, so I'm going to have two of them total, but... Um, first things first, I actually need to heal, because I forgot to do that in the last run I did. So I'm going to do that right now. Scare to use on this guy. Alright, did it. So here, in order to do that, I equip the fire sword and I want a dancing dagger on him. So now, okay, I have a stack of two fire swords, you see. And I am good to go. Man, level 18 came. It's been a long time since that's happened to me. Oh well. But how often does it happen? How many runs do you go? Um, it depends on how much you want to prioritize it, I guess. It's definitely a thing that can happen. So, a fun fact about Paladin Cecil is anybody that's in the critical state, he will automatically cover. Oh, goodness. Yeah, which is apparently everybody in my party right now. I did not expect Yang to get his turn. So Yang has extra experience, too. That's really wonky. So slow, the slow spell in this game can stack up to three times. So you're going to see me using it multiple times on Valvolus just to slow her down. Oh dear. That did not play out at all like I wanted it to. Uh oh, that's super bad. Give me another one of these, actually. And you're gonna drop one of these that I buried because I never thought I'd need them. Right here. Nice miss. Yeah, so this is already going horribly. Slow number three, so Rosa doesn't really need to do anything else. Alright, 
will have her safety heal CC just in case. Six twenty four. Normally that roll is anywhere from eight hundred to thirteen hundred. So this fight's gonna take a little bit longer than I wanted to for sure. Fortunately with the stack slows, it's not so bad. And there I actually timed the jump to where he's gonna come down before she can cast spells in tornado form, so that's good. Um man, she is beating up Cecil. I'm playing this super safe on top of everything else. Yikes. Normally she would have dead been dead last cycle. Doing specific item movement here. I want this, 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 this staff. Yes, okay. All right. Somehow everybody lived. I'm okay with that, I guess. Not an ideal fight by any means, um, but I'll take it. I'm alive. You have time for a quick donation? Absolutely. We have a $30 donation from j Hob saying, Here's my donation from yesterday, because as you saw, I'm very slow. <laughs> Thanks, j Hobbs. So, a shout out to Hobbs, who did uh, Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal and Kingdom Hearts 1.5 yesterday. So what does that put our total at? Uh, 955 Ooh, $45 left to go to that nice 1K. Do it. <laughs> Do it. So story-wise here, uh, Kane's talking about, oh, there's actually four more crystals in the dark world, or the underground, and so we're like, how do we get there? And big giant, I don't know, but Kane has this weird key that goes somewhere in the world, so and you're, if you're playing this game, you kind of have to explore and basically figure out where the key goes. And so this is a point of where people, a lot of people get lost in on, on like a casual run of this game because it gives you very little hints. Uh, when you get to the right town, all the people are like, hmm, yeah, we're descended from dwarves, and dwarves live in the underground. And so they kind of give you a hint there. But um, outside of that, um, it, it can be a point of where people get a little... Uh, lost. A little lost, a little unhappy with this game just because... Fortunately, I mean, it's like right here, so... Eh. It's very easy to toss a Cure 2 down the well, if you're just mashing through. Not that that does anything, you just cure the townspeople. But right now we're gonna poison their water with keys instead. And so, for a glitch coming up here, I'm actually going to be walking up and down a bunch of stairs. Um, a rather significant number of them. And I'll probably be taking my headset off for that. So... I'm gonna make a safety save before I go down, just in the event that I've messed up something in my items, which I don't think I have. But, um, this will... If, if that is the case, it'll allow me to, uh, fix it and complete the run. So let me do this. Oop. Actually, no, let me do this and then resave. Yeah, okay. So here, uh, we, we dropped down in the underground after opening up the mountain to find the Red Wings, which are the bad guys fighting these mysterious people in tanks. And then we get caught, in, we get caught up in the crossfire. 90 style. You yeah, get caught up in the crossfire. Just like that. I 
All right, so I have a lot of counting to do, so I'm going to take my headset off. Uh, ghoul, entertain the masses. All right. So for people that might not know, there are a lot of weird things that happen in Final Fantasy games when you do a specific thing a certain number of times. Uh, going upstairs 64 times in this one is one of them. Uh, another example that I know of is Final Fantasy VI actually has a glitch where if you die a certain number of times you can actually trigger a credits warp um, using arbitrary code execution. Um, so you're going to see him go up and down these stairs quite a bit. As a joke, this was actually called Die Hard Percent for a long time uh, as a reference to the uh, movie. We have a $30 donation from Spike Vegeta, which is great job to year one of the race. Uh, ra year one of race to the finish. Proud to be part of the event. Here's a here's to a great event for years to come. So that's both of the Kingdom Hearts commentary duo making good on their promise. That puts us at $985, guys. We are 15 off. Is it, oh, is it the NES game? Okay, my bad. I thought it was the movie. <laughs> Don't listen to me. Sorry about the rustling. And we're back. So this, uh, these two boss battles are pretty wicked. Uh, the dolls especially. Uh, definitely uh, one of the most notorious bosses in the Final Fantasy IV game entirely. Uh, the way this boss battle works is that um, there's going to be two types of dolls. There's blue dolls that have 1,000 hit points. There's orange dolls that have 300 hit points. The orange dolls hit a lot harder than the blue ones. But um, if one type of doll dies, then a, they have a trigger to where they will turn into a giant doll and um, wreak havoc. And so hopefully that doesn't happen. Ideally, I will kill the two types of dolls close enough together to where um, I skip that trigger. Well, that's fine. Kick will kill that one. That's also kind of okay. Yeah, two kills. Good. Good start. You're going to see me uh, use Rosa to mute my party. That's going to be to prevent hold gas in the next fight. Um, because of status priority, um, they won't be... Uh, party members um, won't be able to be paralyzed because they will have the mute status on. So that's really convenient for the next fight. Here, I'm muting everybody. Ooh, I need to heal Cecil. Definitely need to heal 
Cecil. Oh, never mind. He's gonna be alright. Oh my goodness. Okay. That was actually super close. Okay. Alright, so this fight might be super interesting. Uh, having Rosa dead actually affects what I need to do in this fight a little bit. Um, I'm actually going to have to can't run buffer, whereas normally I don't have to do that. Um, because Golbez gets faster ATB for some reason when somebody's dead. Oh, I hope that was fast enough. Get in the air. Yes! Okay. So here I'm equipping a fire sword, wherever that ended up. And then I have a lot of menuing to do, so that's okay. Please need to go 8 Thunderclaws, okay? Uh, 13 of these. So I'm trying to do all the menuing during dialogue. Because um, that what doesn't waste any time. But um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get it all done, especially because the Rose is dead. Um, that's not what I wanted there. Alright, I'm actually going to wait here. This goes here. Where's my 96 ice claws? There they are. And then my last stack of 13 gears rods are here, so... All right, should be good. So ideally here, um, this Mist Dragon is going to do anywhere from 600 to 900. Higher is obviously better. But the big damage roll is this guy right here. And Cecil. All right. Golbez has 3,000 hit points, and for whatever reason, he's weak to fire. So I actually skipped the whole entire trigger there with Radia showing up, healing the party, so on and so forth. That saves about 45 seconds. And um, so a lot of leveling up Kane and getting him those extra, that extra experience and everything is because of that reason right there, because he does extra damage with more multipliers. And so this girl just randomly appears out of nowhere, uh, if you're not familiar with the story. Um, and it's just kind of weird. And all right. So if you haven't seen this before, Prepare yourselves. It's about to get real. Alright, so one glitch used in both the No 64 route and the 80% route is warping. Sorry, I have to set a very specific value here is warping out to get this darkness crystal and for whatever reason the coders were lazy and just used this room later so we can actually grab this crystal early um, that's not supposed to be there obviously since Golbez just took it in plot but um, yeah so we got the crystal now and then uh, we leave the room and stuff happens And so with that darkness crystal, um, this is the sealed cave. Uh, normally you walk through, get the crystal, walk out. And then the trigger for this cutscene, which is Kane stealing the uh, crystal from you, is having the dark crystal in your inventory. So we had the dark crystal. Now we lost the dark crystal. And there's some blue guy with, like, a cape and blue hair up there. I don't know who he is. So real quick, uh, we did hit that $1,000 mark uh, thanks to a $50 donation. Uh, from Chuckles, who was actually our crazy taxi runner. So, yeah, we are now at $1,035. So, thank you guys so much. Congratulations. Well done to everybody. So, now I'm going to pick up a certain moon man. And so, you're getting a crash course on the end of this game, basically. So, now I'm on the moon. Um. Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. And I'm talking to a moon man. Moon man's all like, yeah, I'm, I'm from the moon. Cecil, you're half from the moon too. Oh, okay. Spoilers. And so Fusoya joins the party. Um, he's going to help you stop Golbez and such. So um, 
We need to do a little bit of menuing here. Oh, my time is very, very bad. This is gonna be fun. Oh, no. What you stop, fine one. Alright. So, we leave the moon, and we're back in here. Yeah, so my floor zero um, is set to this room. Um, normally, floor zero is always the world map. And so whenever I exit um, out of a room, it thinks the world map is that glitched out room. Left. OK, good. So I have a very high chance of locking the game here. Um, so, fortunately, I have a save built in. I'm going to save over my um, seeding files because uh, when you do lock the game up, uh, you have the potential of losing um, your first save and your fourth save. It's just uncontrollable. So, in order for marathon safety and not wanting those saves to get blown away, I'm going to save and then I'll just have to redo it at some other point. So, we. What's that? Yeah. So this is the room I set with the RGB value, um, also known as the Chocobo room. Alright, so this is the moment of truth right here. I'm pretty much guaranteed to soft lock, but let's see. Oh, I made it. I unmade it. Still good? Okay, my save is still there, that's good. Uh, so what happened there is because I made those shopping mistakes, um, my GP value caused the game to crash. Am I in a wall? Can I work on this? Yes, okay. Try number two. Alright, we did it. So there was a sequence, or a series of rooms there, uh, one of which was based off of the in-game timer, and the one immediately following it was based off of GP, um, and I had a bad GP value that caused me to crash. But fortunately, since we have the ability to save, we um, could just reset and try again uh, after adjusting GP. Boop. Boop. Oh, look, we're in the Dwarven Castle again. All right. Walk through the stairs, and eh, I had enough of this. I, I think I think I'm done with glitch rooms right now. I think I'm just going to, uh, you know, I'm just gonna call it call it a day. And here we are, at the final boss. So you might notice uh, Golbez and a certain bearded person here are fighting Zemus. Uh, might not be the certain bearded person you're normally used to having there. And that's because um, the value that is used to uh, basically uh, pull the character data from is the, basically the last data stored away. And normally when you reach this point in the game it's Fusoya. But um, because we're obviously here a little bit early uh, the last one that actually stores away is Sid's, so we see Sid here casting some major magic spells, like the, like the guy that he is. What a boss. He's got his little monocle out, he's ready. Spell casting monocle. And so that whole glitch was a whole series of events. Um, a lot of it was based off of minor things I manipulated, such as the chocobo leaving, or where I parked the black chocobo. Um, in game time or so on and so forth um, all of and that particular room that I was in uh, with the black tiles and like the mages kind of on the bottom uh, those specific black tiles um, allow you to control where you go in the game uh, based off of your inventory and so I was able to manipulate my inventory uh, using very specific items to land on the maps I needed to um, basically allow the plot to progress in such a way to where I could obviously get to this point which is the final the final room, but as well as um, I needed 
to have somebody leave the party so Fusoya can join the party because Fusoya is uh, needed for the final boss. So it's a fun little game that we play uh, in the Final Fantasy IV community. Uh, Sid's Meteo here is going to do anywhere from 1600 to 2100 damage. Um, price is right rules, closest without going over. I'm going to say 1800 myself. Obviously I sprung it on people, so perhaps not the best. 1728, I went over, get wrecked. I was going to be that guy and say 1801. But... It happens. <laughs> happens more often than you think, actually. So here's your miss is like, oh, the uh, Dark Knight used the crystal. You, the man of darkness. And so he just blows him away. Poor Sid. Not strong enough. The beer didn't save him. And so, of course, back on planet Earth, we have Sid. He's everywhere. As well as Yang, who was in our party. Just hopping all over the place, you know. Here we go, the final battle. So I have a very, very in-depth strat as to how to kill this final boss, uh, especially because I'm obviously such a low level. I skipped basically the last half of the game. Um, it was, you know, it took a long time to develop. Uh, a, a lot of effort went into it, and um, you know, it's, it's basically a work of art. Um, obviously having Fusoya is important because he's so, uh, so much of a higher level, he joins at level 50. Um, and I, got, I think the next highest level party member is probably Cecil, he's probably like 18 or 19. So Fusoya is going to be very integral into uh, being able to kill Zero Miss with such a low party level. Of course, we have Ghost Yang talking to Real Yang. And Fusoya talking to Fusoya. But self encouragement. Spoiler alert, be ready on time. Alright. Super in-depth crazy strategy, let's go. Two or three eighteen. Oh, hey, that's not bad at all. Especially for a marathon run with no step route. That's actually really good. So what happened there is um, when I was going through the 64 floor glitch and I took those set of stairs in the Dwarven Castle, that actually wrote to Fusoya's spell list uh, the coordinates of the stairs, basically. And what that does is it's basically writing uh, basically um, the wrong data into his spell list. And um, what the, what one of the things it ends up writing is the spell code for the monster skill reaction, which is an instant kill spell. Um, it kills it kills the user and kills instantly kills the enemy. And so normally, obviously, that's not that's not a spell you would have at your disposal, but because we're able to um, write that spell to his data, then we get free reign over it. And yeah, that's Final Fantasy IV, any percent with no credit war. Alrighty, thank you. That's awesome.